So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get us started on the kind of chopping and preparing side. And then part of it is you've got to massage the salt in, which takes about five, 10 minutes. So I'll do a little bit of chat and um, a little bit of background and stuff like that once we've got started. Feel free to unmute yourself and, and stop me at any point if you want to ask any questions or just type it in the chat box and I'll answer questions as and when um, they kind of occur. Right then, so let's get started. Um, I'm just going to move this down so you can see what I'm doing a little bit better. Um, so just starting off with, I've just got a white cabbage today, but you can use any cabbage you like, Napa cabbage, anything like that. Uh, the most basic kind of recipe just involves having a just white cabbage and salt. And it's as simple as that. But you can add in anything else you like. So I'm today going to use some fresh turmeric. I've got here some ginger uh, and perhaps some, some carrots and things. But kind of anything you've got lying around. I also found a daikon, uh, uh, what is it? daikon radish, okay, which kind of gets used more in kimchi and things like that. But you can pretty much put anything in. Um, to do this. So let's get started with the chopping, uh, those of you that are joining with me. So take off one of the first leaves, okay, and keep that whole. Uh, it'll become more apparent later why we're going to keep it whole. We're going to use it to help kind of hold things down underneath the brine that we're going to produce. So just take off one of the outsides one and keep it as whole as you possibly can. Um, we don't worry too much about washing the cabbage. Um, yeah, I'll to you later, so... Once we've taken off um, the outside layers, it should be nice and clean. But also, we want to kind of keep the natural bacteria on there. That's there. You, can, you might want to scrub um, you know, your carrots and some of your other things if you want to. If they're dirty, you don't want any mud or anything in there. But other than that, it's fine. So I've actually got a half cabbage today. Uh, it was already cut. But what I'm going to do is, after taking off just a kind of top, Cut into it. Take off the whole leaf, put that to one side for the moment. We'll come back to that. And then what I like to do is if you cut it in half or cut it into quarters, you'll see it's got this nice kind of big root bit and stem in the bit. So we're going to take that out. Uh, we don't really want that in there. It's a bit too big and bulky. Um, so I tend to just from the top, kind of cut down in a bit of a diagonal at that point either side of the root and hopefully if you turn it over you should be able to just kind of break it out and we're going to put that to one side as well I haven't done a very good job of it so I'm going to cut out another bit as well okay so this is going to be the main amount that I'm going to use first thing I'm actually going to do is I'm going to get my scales and I'm just going to weigh it. Okay, it's really important the weighing side because the weighing side will tell us how much salt we need to use. Okay, so I'm going to put this on the scale. And it says that it is 767 grams. So I'm just going to write that down. 67 grams and so we're going to keep that amount for later okay so just write it down write it in your phone so you know exactly how much cabbage you've got yep yeah. um and then you can quarter or however you like to just cut the cabbage into slightly more manageable pieces at this point and then you want to try and slice it as thinly as possible I'm just using a knife. If you've got a mandolin at home or anything like that, uh, they're really, really great because you can get probably much, much thinner. So just be careful. Cabbages are quite tough. Mind those fingers and just start kind of taking off slices as thinly as possible. Thinly as possible. Okay. Do you want to do one as well? Have got the bigger knife somewhere? Now, if you get halfway and it's getting a little bit difficult to cut, it's getting a bit unstable, just turn it the other way, okay? So you're making it safe for your hands. Jenny. 
be on it anyway. Now, the, uh, the process that we're using, although it's uh, with making sauerkraut, make you think that perhaps it was originated from Germany. Uh, it's actually originated from China and has been used for millennia, absolutely thousands and thousands of years. It's just a really, really simple way of preserving vegetables um, from that kind of summer harvest through the winter and beyond. Um, you'll find that once you've made this, sauerkrauts will quite happily last for years um, once they're kind of sorted and they've got past the fermentation side of things. Let's move on to this bit as well. What you will find is that with a whole cabbage, you're probably going to need quite a big jar to do this in as well. Um, it tends to take up quite a big a lot of space. Um, I personally, because I do this quite a bit, I have big kind of two litre jars that I use, two litre kilner jars. Uh, I've got a three litre kilner jar as well, depending if I want to do an even bigger amount. Um, so I tend to eat quite a lot of it. Okay, right, let's get a bowl. Now, for me, because I tend to do quite big amounts, I just use a standard washing up bowl, make sure everything's nice and clean. But it just means I can kind of get in there, but any big bowl that you have is absolutely fine. It doesn't really matter too much. So just shove all your cabbage in there. Let's do the last bit. Can I ask, when do we put the carrots in, please? Say that again. When do we put the carrots in, please? Okay, so you can start adding other bits that you want in as well. The other thing you need to do is make sure you weigh these as well. But what I like to do is I like to get the um, cabbage started first. And once we've got the salt in there and start drawing out the water, then I'll put in the slightly harder kind of root vegetables and things because... Um, they're just a little bit in, more difficult to deal with, okay? But you can get them ready. And I'm just gonna start with uh, the cabbage to begin with. Um, and then I'll put in a little bit of ginger and turmeric later on. So. Do we, do we, do we, sorry, do we grace or do we mandolin the carrots? Um, either way, you can do whatever you want. I tend to just chop them in. Um, you can use a mandolin, you can grate them in. And any way is fine. Thanks, sorry. No, 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 please stop me at any point. Um, so once you've got your kind of shredded cabbage, uh, remember we had that weight, which was 767 for mine. Now we're gonna use 2.5% of that weight in salt, okay? So I've got my 767 in my calculator. I'm just gonna multiply that by 0 0.025. And that's going to give me a value of 19.175 grams. So about 19 grams. Now, it don't have to be super, super accurate. Um, but so around about 19 grams is going to be absolutely fine for this. And then I'm going to weigh my salt. Now, um, 
I've got some pink salt uh, because I use it a lot for my company, so I have loads of it around. You can pretty much use any salt as long as it's not iodized. Um, but I tend to mainly use sea salt uh, as well is my main kind of go-to. It's relatively cheap uh, and nice and easy to use. So with the salt, let's weigh out 19 and a half grams of that. And with this, it can go straight into our pot. Nine grams. Cool, so yeah, about 19 grams. And then this is the fun part. And this part, what you wanna do is you wanna take your cabbage, you wanna get your hands right in there and you really wanna start mixing that salt in. So scrunching it between your hands, bashing it down, putting some weight on it, really, really, really kind of massage into it, okay? And you're gonna to wanna to do this for a good kind of five to 10 minutes. Now, what you'll notice is that instantly the second you get the salt in there and start massaging, it starts drawing all of the liquid out of the cabbage. And that's exactly what you want to happen. Okay, so you want to try and get as much of this liquid out as possible. And this will get the, the process kind of started. Now, you can use uh, red cabbages for this as well. I love using red cabbage. You may want to um, use gloves. Uh, I tend not to, but it will leave your hands a little bit red for a few hours afterwards, uh, which is you know, not the end of the world. Now, the idea of this is that as you drag the water out, you're making a kind of brine. OK, and I'm going to talk about brine ferments later on. But the idea is, is that you're making a nice salty solution and there's lots and lots of natural bacteria in the air. And the idea of this is you want to create an environment that encourages the growth of one called lactobacillus. Now, lactobacillus is um, works in anaerobic conditions, so without oxygen um, to create lactic acid from any of the sugars that you have in your in your cabbage uh, or anything that you're trying to ferment and it's this lactic acid that then preserves the food stuff for uh, later and the idea is is that you're allowing the lactobacillus to, to breed and fry and that stops anything else forming in there at all Stephen, we had a question Someone's yes, asking in the chat, what's the difference between sauerkraut and kimchi? Uh, brilliant. Um, so sauerkraut is just with kind of, um, tends to just be white cabbage or maybe red cabbage. Um, it, the only ingredients it tends to have is the salt and then caraway seeds, it tends to be the traditional sauerkraut. Now kimchi is slightly different. You use um, a Chinese kind of lettuce cabbage or natural cabbage. Uh, and in this case, you're adding salt but you're also adding um, lots of kind of chili so goat chuang is a, a special type of chili powder that you get out there and a lot more kind of spices but the process is basically the same so the only difference between the sauerkraut and kimchi is just the extra things that are added in um i mean you can you can add anything in. i know people that use uh do turmeric and pineapple uh sauerkrauts which are absolutely um, and you can do various different kind of flavors with kimchi. Uh, you can make kimchi vegan by omitting the uh, fish sauce and some of the other things that are in there. But the process is exactly the same. It's basically just salt and then let it do its own thing naturally over time. Now you should see here, if I squeeze it, we've got lots and lots and lots of water coming out. That's absolutely brilliant. So I'm probably gonna only do this for another couple of minutes. And at this point, 
actually, now that we've got to this point, I'm just going to try this off. I'm just going to add a couple of my other additives that I want to, that I'm kind of really only adding in for flavor at this point. They don't make too much of a difference. I'm not putting very much of them in. So I'm going to take a little bit of ginger, first of all, and then also a little bit of fresh turmeric. Now, the fresh turmeric will also give it a beautiful yellow color, which is really cool as well. That's one side. Um, I learned this trick from a, a friend, actually, a long time ago, probably about 20 years ago, for peeling uh, ginger, just using a spoon um, to grate, to kind of take that outside skin off. Steve, bring it closer to you so we can see what you're doing. <laughs> that one there. Okay, so yeah, I'm using the just a spoon just to scrape off the skin. Uh, I find it much easier than a peeler. Now, I'm only putting a, a small amount of this in because ginger goes quite far. Um, it would be quite a strong flavour. And I'm just literally just going to chop a bit off and turn it into some thin kind of julienne slices. Um, to go in there as well. And then make it even smaller so that it'll spread out nicely throughout. Throw that straight in. And then I'm going to do exactly the same with a little bit of um, turmeric. This is fresh turmeric, We're really lucky in Brixton because we have a local market that just has everything fresh. Um, I'd never actually seen fresh turmeric until I moved to Brixton. And same thing, just gonna peel with the spoon. And once again, just kind of fine chop it. Um, same with the turmeric. A little bit of turmeric goes a long way as well. We add all carrots now as well. Yeah, if you throw the carrots in at this point now, perfect. So that goes in. Uh, another thing that I'm going to put in, I absolutely love um, caraway seeds. Now, there's loads of other things that you can put in instead. So fennel is a great substitute for caraway seeds as well. Um, you can put in whole coriander seeds, you can put in whole mustard seeds, pepper, you name it. Um, at this point, you can pretty much do whatever you want based on your kind of uh, taste and flavour. And, you know, I tend to never really make the same sauerkraut again twice. Um, every time I do it, I tend to change things. I don't really write anything down. So, you know, I'm just going to put in about a teaspoon, maybe a teaspoon and a half. Just kind of sprinkle them over and straight into my cabbage like that and then I'm going to bring it back and just give it one last couple of minutes another really nice massage make sure that everything's kind of mixed through if we added and, more like carrot and do we need more salt and um, if you've only put in a little bit of carrot then it's not it doesn't make, make too much difference but if you put in quite a bit then yeah weigh it and you want that 2.5 percent by weight again Steven? Steven? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Um, will you send us the recording? Because I'm so, so behind. Say that again? I'm... Will you send us the recording? Recording? Yeah. Um, I, We're I... recording it. We're recording it. We can send it round afterwards. Yes. I'm behind. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> that's all right no worries yes thank you thank you for that sophie awesome uh yes yeah, so it will be available afterwards um probably put it up on uh, the instagram feeds and things like that if you can as well for those of you who turned up late um but yeah don't worry okay uh sorry so, I've, yeah i've got a question the same as someone has posted um if we don't have fresh turmeric can we use turmeric powder Yes, turmeric powder is fine. Any dry spices are absolutely fine um, to be used as well. And uh, yeah, have a bit of fun with it. Like try putting in some cumin, uh, whether it's dried um, whole or powdered, it's absolutely fine. Um, and just see what happens really. As I say, it's a bit of an experiment. Um, if you like the kind of sourness of sauerkraut, you're, you're going to get that. And the other flavors just kind of enhance it as well. So yeah, powdered is absolutely fine. Um, and I mean, you can, you can literally add anything in you like to be honest with you um <laughs> any vegetables that you want you, i know some people have used um eggplant and things like that so aubergine goes in there as well some people will put in yeah. cucumber and things like that as well so yeah it's uh there don't seem to be any boundaries at all okay hi steve so, uh, hiya is when would you advise for chilies? I know you like chilies, so I'm sure you've done this before, but um, when would you advise to put chilies in? Um, so, yeah, so the chilies could go in at this point now as well. Um, you probably don't want to do too much mixing with your hands if you're going to throw chilies in there, um, <laughs> unless you've got kind of gloves on, uh, because obviously uh, the capsaicin can stay around on your skin for quite a while and rubbing eyes and things like that isn't to be um recommended but yeah at this point you can start putting in various other flavors i wouldn't put too much um too much heat in there unless you really love the chilies but i'm i'm actually not going to i really like my sauerkraut without chilies um probably the only thing i don't put chili into to be fair right so next thing is to go and grab our jar oh Now, today I'm just going to be using these kind of wide mouth kilner jars. I think this is a litre size uh, with the screw top lids. Um, so, but any, any jam jar at all will work. It doesn't matter at all, uh, as long as it's got a lid. The kilner jars that have these kind of fastings on them are great because they're easier to what we call burp when the um, ferment gets going. And with the rubber seal, um, they're just a lot easier to kind of deal with. Also, I've noticed sometimes that because you're producing lactic acid, the little inserts in some of these um, jam jars and the lids tends to get a bit rusty and corrode a bit. Um, so if you've got these sorts of jars, that's brilliant. I'd use them, but it really, it's, it's not the end of the world if you don't straight into these jars and they work great. So just make sure that you've got these, these are nice and clean uh, before you start. They don't need any special sanitization or anything like that. Just hot soapy water is absolutely fine and let them dry a bit. Um, main idea is that you just wanna make uh, the environment you're giving the natural bacteria as, as kind of good a start as you possibly can. So with your jar in hand, then take your sauerkraut. This bit can get a little bit messy. Uh, one of the, I think a jam funnel, then you can use a jam funnel to sort that out. But if not, it's basically at this point, you've just got to get it all in the jar. Um, so however way you can, just start putting it into the jar. As I said, it is a bit of a messy one. Um, down as well, that's great. If not, I actually use a little bit of tea. I just use an old rolling pin um, just to kind of press it down a little bit because what you really want to do is try and get as much in as possible uh, and you'll find you'll be surprised how much you can get in a jar if you really try. Steve are you putting a fluid in as well? Yep everything goes in absolutely and then push it down as we go along. Um, 
The other reason why I quite like using the big kiln is because I can get my hand in them. Um, so you can push everything down from the top, which is nice and easy to do. Now, don't worry too much if you make a mess, you can just what, rinse off the jar afterwards once it's closed. Do make sure to get all of that lovely, lovely juice in there as well. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, it's a little bit of a mess, but that's all right. <laughs> Get some plates in. Okay, once you've got it in there, um, give it a good press down as much as you can. Now, what hopefully you'll be able to see, I don't know how good the quality is in the video, but hopefully you should see that as I'm pushing this down, all of the liquid yeah, it's now coming to the top. Let's move it closer. You should be able to see I've got lots and lots of liquid it, yes. there. And the idea is, is you want to try and push everything down using your fingers or anything you can to make sure that all of the cabbage is below that liquid. Okay, you don't. You want to try and make sure there's nothing sticking out the top. Now, the reason for this is very important. And the reason is, is that you want an anaerobic condition. So you want no oxygen to get to the, um, the cabbage, okay? Because the lactobacillus wants to work with no oxygen. That's how it will create this lactic acid. Uh, and anything that's exposed to oxygen has the potential to go moldy or rot. So if we get it below that water line or that liquid line as much as possible, we kind of know we're safe. Now, at this point, we can also go back to getting that leaf saved, okay? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of shape this a little bit so that it fits inside my jar, hopefully. And you can kind of use this as a little bit of a cap, okay? So if you get it in your jar on the top, you might, you can use a couple of bits if you want. And then what you're gonna do so you should be able to push it down and that kind of acts as a little extra barrier that helps you kind of keep everything under the liquid. So I can do this oh. now. Excellent. Okay, so should end up something rather like this. You can see my cabbage leaves on the top, the whole ones. There's lots and lots of lovely liquid going on in there as well. Um, now other ways of doing this is uh, I've got old Pringle lids go in there really, really well. Make a couple of holes in them to let the liquid through them. You can use that to weigh things down as well. Um, they're, they're really great. Uh, any sort of lids, I kind of tend to hack up anything I get. You can also, uh, leaves down as well so if you've got any kind of old little shot glasses or this is actually a candle holder or something like that you can just use that to put in the top just as a bit of a weight you can see there if I push it down it means that everything is covered below that and that can just sit in there as well what do we do if we've not got enough liquid do we need to like add some water or just keep squishing okay great question so if you don't have enough liquid, that's absolutely fine. It should, over a day or so, produce more liquid. So what you can do at the moment, just make sure it's all really, really nicely, tightly packed down. Don't worry too much if there isn't too much liquid. Um, and then check it. You need to check it kind of every day um, to see that it gets started. If after a couple of days, you're finding you still don't have a liquid, you can just add a, maybe a little bit of water with some... OK, so with that, maybe just, um, you know, take a teaspoon of salt. Um, water, if you've got bottled water, it's better than the chlorinated water. Tap. Um, but what I 
probably will find is that in a couple of days you'll notice that a lot more of the water has come out um, it does sometimes tend to depend on how fresh your cabbage is if it's slightly older but they tend to not have quite as much water in them um, but it does come out over time so my uh, red kraut that I did um, didn't have very much liquid in it uh, to begin with but a few days later you could see a lot of the liquid had all bubbled to the top and it was really really nice again so at this point you're kind of your kraut is ready um, you can get your lid and just put your lid on and give it a rinse off in the sink if you want to now what will happen now is hopefully over the next couple of days this will then start fermenting and you'll be able to tell if it's fermenting by you'll be able to see little bubbles forming inside it it might get a little bit foamy and frothy at the top now what you want to do once that's started is just carefully open the top just a little crack they, this is called burping and the idea is that the lactobacillus to create lactic acid but also carbon dioxide gas and if you leave it to build up um, it's potentially you don't want that to happen okay because it can break the, the glasses and the jars but you do need to keep an eye on it now after the fermentation has started within two to three days it will then take possibly a week to two weeks finishes fermenting okay so when it stops kind of producing loads of gas there'll be a good kind of four days in the middle of that where it is quite vigorous and you should get quite a lot of gas forming and you'll need to burp it maybe once or twice a day after those couple of weeks it should have calmed down quite a bit and you'll be able to just leave it and maybe check it every few days now to be honest with you you can start eating this at any point you like i personally um like them to go for about a month um, to get the right level of acidity for my personal taste but for you guys that haven't done this before um, maybe after a week or so try a little bit open it try a little bit see if you like it if you do and it's at the right level for you then you can then just put it in your fridge or somewhere cold like that uh, if you're not happy with it you want it to be sour then just leave it out for a bit more so my red kimchi has been out for about two months now it's probably at the right level that i want it to just because it's cold at the moment so everything's a bit slower than it would be before so that's why it's had a couple of months because it has been so cold um but what i'm going to do now with that now is i'll probably put it into smaller jars and then i'm going to leave it in the fridge and in the fridge it will last forever now a question that's always asked is what about kind of um, mold and things like that now you may well see a white kind of scum that forms on the top of the kimchi that's nothing to worry about that's most likely going to be something called calm yeast or calm yeast um, so it's just a natural yeast that's in the air it doesn't look very nice but it's not affecting anything else and you can just scrape that off the ones that you want to watch out for is if you get any coloured mould. OK, so if you're getting blues and greens and things like that, it's not really worth the risk. You know, everything here is so cheap. It's disappointing, especially if you wait, you know, you've wait, waited for it for so long. But just get rid of it. It's not really worth it if you're getting those sorts of mould. But if you're just getting a thin kind of scummy white, that's good. That's calm yeast and that's absolutely fine. Um, you, you can just scrape that off and use it. Uh, when I first started fermenting, I tended to get these carn yeast infections quite a lot. I will say that over time, I, I don't get them anymore. And I think maybe that's just being a bit more confident, um, maybe not opening them to the oxygen as much as possible, because that's what's allowing the yeast to, to form. Um, but it, it's, it's just one of those kind of things. I, as I say, if you, if you kind of leave them well alone, they tend to be quite happy on their own. Um, another thing i was going to say is if you find that you haven't had fermentation starting after maybe a week what you can do is you can open it and give it a bit of a stir every day now what that does is that introduces more bacteria from the air from the air into it and hopefully will build up that kind of um population in there or perhaps it needs to go somewhere that's a little bit warmer if you can find somewhere warmer to put it um I will say if you're going to put this in a uh, like a cupboard or something like that, 
if you haven't left very much room at the top, this kind of airspace, you might want to put underneath it or a saucer, because what can happen is when the lactobacillus starts breeding, it can get really, really bubbly. You may get the liquid rise up to a point where it goes over the top and spills out. So just a kind of word of warning, it is a good idea if you're going to put it somewhere where you can't look at it all the time. Um, I tend to, when they're starting, I'll have it on my kitchen counter just so that every day when I go in there, I know, okay, check the, check the sauerkraut, check the sauerkraut. After the couple of weeks that it's done its fermentation, it's finished, you can then put it somewhere and just forget about it. Um, I've got jars of chilies and stuff that have been, you know, in a cupboard for a, a good few months and I, I never really taken care of them until I want to go and use them. So uh, that's kind of it for the, for the kimchi, uh, sorry, the sauerkraut side of things. Are there any other questions that anyone has? Can we also cover with a tea towel instead of a lid? Um, it's a good question. You can do. I've, I've read in a few places you can. The only issue with that is that you're introducing or you're allowing more oxygen to get in. And we don't really want to have that oxygen in there because that is the, has the potential for mould. Now, if you've got it in a jar that has a lid, the carbon dioxide that's being produced then creates a nice kind of barrier to any other oxygen. And as you just gently open it, you don't want to take it fully off. You'll hear the gas escape. That's pushing out any oxygen and making sure that you've got this lovely um, environment that's really, really safe for all of the lactobacillus rather than enough. But um, I have read you can do like with um, kombuchas and things like that. You want that oxygen in there because of the yeast that's working with this, but we don't really want oxygen in there. So I, I wouldn't say um, unless you really have to cover it with that, um, unless it started for after a couple of days and then open it and give it some good stirring. Uh, what are your favorite ways to eat sauerkraut? Um, I have it with everything. So I, I love salads. So I have a salad. I'll just take a big kind of spoonful of it, put it on there. I put it on the top of burgers. Uh, I'm quite happily just eat it straight out of the jar, uh, which is why I kind of make so much and go through so much as well. Um, so yeah, any, any which way, and I have certain different types, um, kind of things. So depending on what I'm cooking with, and I do also make kimchi, uh, which I eat as well. I have that on, on just on the side as a little side dish with, um, various Asian foods that I, I love cooking as well. Uh, let's just go back up because I think I've missed a couple of questions. Uh, can we use other kinds of cabbage? Yeah, any any type of cabbage. Absolutely, any type of cabbage uh, is absolutely fine for that. Um, and you can also do mixes. So my red uh, red kimchi here, uh, sorry, red kraut here was actually a mixture of white, uh, fresh green, um, sort of really really thin thinner stuff. It's more like lettuce, uh, and then the red as well. So you can mix and match as much as you want. And as I say, also add in any other vegetables that you want as well. Uh, what's the weirdest flavour of sauerkraut you've made? Um, I haven't really done anything too weird. I'm a bit of a traditionalist when it comes to the sauerkraut. I love, I love caraway. Um, so to be honest with you, the, the only one that I've done that's been a bit more wild is the turmeric uh, and ginger. Um, I quite like my sauerkraut to be really simple and clean, but you can be as extravagant as you like. Um, I'm quite tempted to try a pineapple one, pineapple, just so it'd be the same similar recipe to the one I've done today, but add in a little bit of chopped up pineapple in there as well, because uh, I have ferments around here, uh, who, which was really, really nice. Um, so yeah, it kind of goes with, with every meal, uh, to be honest with you, with, for me. Um, so yeah, what's we got? Sorry, Steve, uh, just... Yeah. Um, I know you make uh, chilli sauce as well and you've mentioned kimchi a few times. Like, what are the differences? Because I know some chilli sauces ferment as well. So kind of what's the differences between like the kimchi, chilli sauce and like this process? Um, so the kimchi is a very, very similar process to this, um, although they tend to keep it full leaves with the kimchi. So they kind of uh, rub salt straight into the leaves, leave that for a bit of time. Uh, shake the salt off and then um, the, the Napa cabbage and, and doing it exactly the same way as I would sauerkraut, but then adding in this gochujang 
uh, and the spices and other things like that. But the process is exactly the same for that. Now, for my chili sauces, I used brine ferment, um, and that was actually what I wanted to speak to you guys about. So what I've just set up really quickly is I've got a, another small jar. Now into this, I've just put some whole cloves of garlic um, and variety of chilies. You can also put in onion, you can put in uh, fresh like sweet peppers, anything like that at all. Now for these, I do a brine ferment. So rather than taking the salt and massaging it in, what I'm gonna do instead, just really, really quickly, is I'm gonna make a two and a half percent brine solution. And that's really, really simple to do. I'm basically just gonna get some mineral water, about half a litre, because uh, I'm only doing a small one. And then for this, I'm going to make a two and a half percent brine. Now, you can see on the internet, it says that you can go up to about 10 percent. Um, I found that for me, it's two and a half. I've done some, if I'm doing ferments that I perhaps want to leave for longer, maybe for a year, I tend to bump it up to about five percent. Um, I would never go below two percent. The main reason is, is I've never heard of it happening personally, but apparently botulism can be an issue if you don't have a high enough salt concentration, because what that does is the salt inhibits anything else from growing. And then once lactobacillus has got started, it makes it all nice and acidic. And then that's what keeps everything preserved, um, which leads me to the question, once open, how long will it last? Um, if in the fridge, pretty much indefinitely, um, what the cold of the fridge slows down the bacteria, so hopefully it won't get too much uh, more sour. But I've got a kimchi in the fridge that I've had for a year. And so I made it in a big, big one like this that stays in the fridge that I have down in the cellar. And then I basically just take out amounts of it and put it into a smaller jar that I have in my normal fridge for eating. So it can last, it can last easily a year if not longer, if kind of looked after and kept cold, nice and cold. So let's go back to the brine. Um, the way that we figure out the amounts for brine is I've got half a litre of water and water sensitive about 500 grams. OK, so I'm going to put 500 into here and I'm going to use the same 2.5 percent. So just times that by 0.025 and that gives me 12.5. So I'm going to add of salt to this brine okay um we use mineral water for this uh, and that's because the uh, municipal tap water that we have has got chlorine and chloramines in um, and although uh, I know some people do use their tap water, it just tends to slow the process down uh, and there's less chance of allowing the lactobacillus to take a nice hold. So I always use mineral water for all of my ferments. Um, you can get it for uh, five litres from Tesco's for about a pound. Uh, that was from stuff I use is from Iceland and it's a pound for five litres. So, you know, for the sake of a very small amount of money, it's, it's worth it just to make sure you're kind of giving, you know, if you're going to eat it, uh, give it a, a good start as you can. So what I'm doing now is I'm just um, dissolving this salt to make a nice brine solution, two and a half percent. And then I'm just going to take my jar, which has got all my chilies and various other things in there, the garlic, and pour that over the chilies. Okay. Same idea with this. You want to leave a little bit of kind of head space if you can, um, using a glove or any implement you can, just press the chilies down so they're all underneath the liquid. Um, if you've got big kilner jars for this, you can fill up a Ziploc bag with brine, so salt solution, use that to weigh it down. People use rocks in Ziploc bags, um, wrapped in cling film, as I say, I use glass jars. Um, bits of Pringles tin lids, anything you can find just to keep it down. Um, I worry less about 
keeping things down now because, just because I have a lot more trust in the process and I tend to not, um, I suppose, fiddle with them as much as I used to. I think the reason I was getting you know, calm um, and just being far too inquisitive, whereas now I just, I'd leave them and just let them do their thing. Um, I've got fermenters with 15 kilos of chilies in, uh, stainless steel ones. I can't see what's going on. I've just got to trust that it's doing its thing. And so far, every time I open them up after a month, um, it has worked. Um, with this, uh, some people, uh, on a commercial kind of side of things, you need to pH test everything to make sure that the acidity level has got down low enough to make it shelf stable. Uh, for you guys at home, if it tastes sour and acidic, then it's good to go and it's fine. Um, as I said, it's, it's very, very rare that you have any other problems. But similar things with this, if you see uh, blue or green mold, just bin it. It's not worth the effort at all. Uh, if you get a, a, a slight film of white on there, that's absolutely good to go. Um, and I tend to find that these with the brine, they tend to be quite a lot more uh, active and you will tend to get the brine solution coming out and then spilling out the top of the jar. So I tend to always with these for the first couple of weeks, have them over a saucer or have them over a bowl or something, um, just because they tend to be really, really active. All right, let's have a look at these last questions. Uh, will lazy scientists be releasing any sauerkraut? It's a good question. Um, I actually won't, no. Um, there's some really, really good sauerkraut producers in Brixton already. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I kind of do sauerkraut just for me. Um, I'm quite busy at the moment with teaching and trying to make sauce and keep up with my stockists. So I, I don't really think I can add anything else to it at the moment. Although I do want to add some spice rubs um, for when the barbecue season starts up. But yeah, I'm, uh, for the moment, definitely not. I've, I think I've really taken on too much as it is. Uh, what have you got? Can you add apple? Yes, you can add apple um, and anything like that. Apples and pears go really, really well. I've used apple before. Um, they tend to be even more vigorous because you get a lot more kind of sugars in there. Um, so with the more sugar content or the high sugar content of it, uh, the more kind of vigorous a reaction you're going to get. And there's more sugars in there for the lactobacillus, which is great. Uh, and the same with chili sauces as well. We do ferments. You can add in literally anything you like. I tend to find that with fruits, so uh, blackberries, blueberries and, and cherries, those sorts of things, they need to be fermented for a shorter amount of time if you want to keep the fruity flavour. Um, so I, I do my fruit ferment separately and then add that ferment to my chili ferments afterwards. So I'll tend to only ferment for maybe three or four days with a fruit ferment and then add that into my chilies that have been fermenting for say a month or two just to keep that kind of flavour. But you can also, once you've got this, um, I'm going to leave this for a month, then I'll drain off the brine and then food process it to turn it into a paste and then I'll add a bit more brine back into it just to uh, get the right consistency and then that would be the point that I tend to add in my fresh fruits and things like that um, maybe I can do another workshop at some point on on chili sauce that'd be quite good fun I think uh, where can we buy lazy ferments from um, so I have a website I'm on Instagram as well lazy ferments on Instagram and I have a website lazyscientistsources.co.uk um, so yeah you can either hit me up on that or buy it directly through the website I'm also in a few shops in Brixton um, Guzzle, Ashby's uh, and various ones over the country now it seems to be expanding I've just got into a new one called Liberty Cherie in Portobello Road which is well, probably one of my most beautiful little shops I've ever seen in my life so it's really really nice um <laughs> <laughs> have uh and yeah also but yeah sorry brixton brewery at taproom um you can get them there when things open up again which is great um these guys have been supporting me from the beginning both them and london beer lab actually have just been really supportive when i started off um so it's nice to be able to do something for you guys uh have you ever tried brewing yes uh i i love brewing i'm a home brewer i used to work uh run workshops brewing workshops actually 
at a, another local brewery. Um, I don't have the time for it. Any time I do have now is all about source production. Uh, so any spare time I do is, is that and trying to chasing orders and things like that. Uh, does ginger ferment well? Yeah, ginger ferments really, really well. It's got lots of sugars in there. There's a thing you can make called a ginger bug, which is a starter. And I think it's literally just um, water, sugar and ginger. And you can use it for making ginger beers um, as a sourdough starter, all types of stuff. So yeah, uh, ginger is really, really good. Uh, and for things like kombucha, which is a kind of fermented tea, I put ginger in for the second fermentation because I know that it's going to give it a nice, really big kickstart and get that fermentation, and make it nice and carbonated and bubbly. Uh, favorite chili. Um, my favorite chili is a habanero type chili called a fatali. Um, they're kind of bright yellow, quite long. They're, they're really hot, but they've got this um, really interesting earthy flavor that I've just never found from any other chilies, but that's, that's definitely my favorite. And then a close second would be the Scotch bonnet, um, which is great living in Brixton because you can get kilos of them everywhere. Um, but yeah, I absolutely love the Scotch bonnet. I love that fruity kind of flavor you get from them. I'm I think, I think we're almost getting to the end there, unless anyone has any more questions. Um, I'd just like to thank you all really for, for joining us today and thank Brixton Brewery um, Sophie and Jez for inviting me along and sorting this out for me. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to do something like this. Uh, it's the first time I've done it and I've actually really enjoyed it. So I hope you guys have as well. Um, any questions you do have as well, um, if you've got Instagram, it lazy ferments. I'm very happy for you to send me questions. If you're struggling or you're worried about something to do with one of your ferments or something hasn't worked how you expect it to, please just message me. I'll always get back to you and help you out um, with that. So yeah, other than that, uh, happy Sunday, everyone. Hopefully you're gonna go for a walk in the snow. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, Steve. Thanks. Take care. Yeah, take care, Mum and Dad. Yeah, <laughs>